Here's a really interesting fluid mechanics problem that's looking at a non-inertial frame of reference in the form of a spinning tube which contains some liquid and what we're asked to find is the velocity of the emerging fluid with respect to the spinning tube and if you'd like to see anything like this in the future or if you have any suggestions for any problems that you'd like then let me know in the comments so for this problem what i would do is before we um before we try finding the velocity i would first So let's read the question a bit more carefully. So we're dealing with a tube of a length L, and then we also have the liquid column given to us as lowercase h. And that liquid is an ideal fluid, and we have the fact that the end, the this end, is open to the atmosphere and this is going to become relevant shortly and this other end here which is closed has a small orifice so the liquid is actually able to escape with a certain velocity and we're asked to find what is that velocity or what's the relative velocity with respect to the spinning tube as a function of age in other words as this h changes, in other words, as h becomes smaller as time goes by, how does that velocity uh, change as well? Or what is the velocity of the fluid with respect to that h? So let's see how to actually approach this. The first thing I would do is I would try to go for uh, an infinitesimal analysis. So I would actually choose an element of a fluid element like this which is located at a distance let's call this x away from the x of rotation and i'm going to zoom this in a bit so this is my fluid element like this and we're going to draw free body diagram now and by that i mean we're going to draw all the forces acting along the horizontal direction and there are two forces the first one is this which is pressure multiplied by area and that's the pressure of the liquid to the left of this fluid element and then we have pressure we have another pressure which is dp um, pascals higher than the one on the left and then we also have that the thickness of this infinitesimal element is dx okay so as we increase the distance by dx the pressure changes by an amount dp and we we will try to find the relationship between the static pressure p and the distance x so this imbalance in pressures which results in an imbalance in forces will actually create a centripetal acceleration this way right and that has to happen because the tube rotates so the centripetal acceleration is pointing towards the x of rotation so this is what we have we've got p plus dp multiplied by a and then minus pa equals the mass of the fluid element which is just dm for now multiplied by this centripetal acceleration which is omega squared which is the uh, angular velocity multiplied by the radius which is of course x so you can notice that pa and minus pa cancel out which gives us dp multiplied by a equals dm now in terms of dm what i will write instead is i will convert this into density multiplied by volume so we have density and then the volume is going to be the volume of this fluid element basically which is um, a multiplied by dx okay so this used to be dm now the reason why the volume is a times dx 
is because this fluid element is cylindrical in shape. So it's got a cross-sectional area of A, it's got a thickness or height of the cylinder as dx, so that's the volume. And then we've got omega squared x. So another thing that cancels out is the area, which tells us that the static pressure in this case doesn't actually depend on the cross-sectional area of the tube. So it doesn't matter if the tube is narrower, for example. So what this gives us is that dp equals rho omega squared and then x dx, which is a clear direct relationship between the pressure as well as the distance x away from the x sub rotation. So if we integrate uh, like that, and I can take rho and omega squared outside because they're just constants, uh, then we have that the static pressure p equals rho omega squared and then x squared over 2 plus a constant. So this is indefinite integration, which means that we end up with a constant of integration, which we have to find out. And we're going to find out this constant using some boundary conditions. And here's what we know. We know that this end of the tube is open to the atmosphere. In other words, the pressure here as well as here, 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 or anywhere in this side, um, including the pressure on the left-hand side of the liquid column, is the same as the atmospheric pressure. So here's what we can write. At x equals, now remember, we're measuring our x from the axis of rotation, which means that this distance from here to here is, well, we know what that is. We, that's L minus H, because the tube has a length L, the um, liquid, column has a length h, so we have to subtract the two of them, and that gives us the length of the air column, which is L minus h. So when x is equal to L minus h, the pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So I'm going to substitute those in here, and that's going to allow us to find what c is. So atmospheric pressure equals, we have half rho omega squared, and that I have L minus H squared plus C. Okay, so now the C is PA minus one half rho omega squared L minus H squared. Okay, so that's our integration constant. So I'll take this integration constant and I'll put it back in here. And that's going to give us pressure as a function of distance away from the X of rotation. So we have pressure P equals, so if we rearrange this slightly, we have PA plus one half rho omega squared x squared minus um, the remaining term, which is one half rho omega squared L minus H squared like this. So technically this problem can also be solved using Reynolds transport equation but I'm going to find that velocity in a slightly different way. Now, normally we wouldn't really be allowed to apply Bernoulli um, throughout this, um, or across this tube between two points because this is not an inertial frame of reference anymore. But instead what I'll do is, I will actually be able to get away with it because the way in which I'll apply Bernoulli is as follows. So I will apply Bernoulli just before point P and just after point P. So if I try to sketch that somehow, we have, using this equation here, we can actually find what the pressure here is by substituting X with L, as you'll see in a second. And then um, I will be able to apply Bernoulli from here to here, and that's going to give us that velocity that we're seeking. So let's see how we can first find the pressure here. Let's call this point one and this point two. So the pressure at point one can be found by substituting x with L, right? Because at this first green dot, 
your x is equal to the length of the tube, which is L. So P1 is PA, that's the atmospheric pressure, plus one half rho omega squared. Now, normally it would be one half rho omega squared L squared, but instead I'm going to combine everything and I'll factorize the one half rho omega squared so that things become a bit more tidy and I get this. Okay, so this is the pressure just before the water comes out through the orifice. And now I will apply Bernoulli between point one and point two. So I will say that between point one and point two, I'll apply Bernoulli. Bernoulli like this, and here's what we have. We have the static pressure at point one plus one half rho the velocity one squared equals the pressure at two plus one half rho v two squared. Of course, normally there's some potential energy that we have to take into account, but in this case, we're just analyzing everything along this straight horizontal line, so there are no um, potential energy terms anywhere. Now let's see what each of those terms actually are. First of all, this is going to be approximated to zero because the cross-section of the tube is much bigger than the cross-section of the orifice. So in other words, we'll say that the velocity of the liquid inside the tube is uh, insignificant compared to how fast the liquid is coming out. So we can then say that P1 is, well, this here, which is PA plus, and then we have one half rho omega squared, and then we have L squared, minus L minus H squared equals, and then we have the pressure at point two. And we also know what the pressure at two is because two is in the atmosphere, so that is the same as PA. Like that, and then plus one half, I'll just write as one half rho V squared, right? then rho V two squared, because this is the only velocity we're actually dealing with. So, we can cancel out the atmospheric pressures, which is nice. We can also cancel out the one half rho on both sides. And that will give us that V squared equals omega squared multiplied by L squared minus, and I'm gonna expand that bracket, which is L squared minus two LH plus H squared. And another thing you'll note is that the L squared and the minus L squared cancel out, which will finally give us that V squared equals omega squared. And then in this bracket, I'll have two LH minus H squared. So you can leave it like that. But what I will do is I will actually take out an H squared from the brackets. So that will give me two L over H minus one. So the final thing is to just take the square root of everything. So we have the velocity equals omega H square root of two L over H minus one. And this gives us the relationship between the, the velocity of the liquid that comes out as well as this liquid column H. So what you can do now is you can leave it like that or you can plot the dependence between the velocity as well as H. So you can see how V, how the velocity of the emerging liquid changes with respect to H. And that's the end of the question.